Well, hello there. Greetings and welcome, my friends, and welcome to Western Civilization II, otherwise known as HS-242. In this first class module, we'll be discussing the rise of the exploring spirit and all of the developments that it initiated, starting up around the early 1400s, but lasting well into the 17th century. And in particular, what I'd like to discuss is how the discoveries of this age brought about an end of the traditional feudalism that we were discussing at the end of Western Civilization I, and it turned this traditional agrarian economy into something new. It replaced it with what's known as a mercantile economy. And this will largely bolster the ideas of capitalism, trading companies, resource monopolies, and even nationalistic impulses. All of this will be brought about by this change that started with exploring new lands and new vistas. Now, unique to this lecture, we will be focusing on the early Portuguese initiatives, and specifically their drives to reach the spice-producing areas of India and the Far East. So, if you're ready, Go ahead and strap yourself down, and let's find out what happens when the size and scope of the world literally doubles overnight. So, to begin with, I want to ask this question. Why go exploring? What do people gain from going exploring? And I guess a closely related question to this is, what needs to happen to make worldwide exploration even possible? So, go ahead and brainstorm with me for just a moment on that those set of questions. What do you gain? Well, you gain knowledge of the environment. You gain an understanding of where people, groups, and resources are located. And you begin to understand that there's an easier way of doing things. At least where travel is concerned. Well, all of these benefits certainly played a part, but... In particular, I want to discuss five factors that seem to be crucial in understanding why European nations, starting around 1400 all the way through the 1500, began throwing caution to the wind and said, let's go set sail and let's improve where we are. And the first of these factors is the Crusades. Now, as you remember from last year's Western Civ class, starting around 1096, European monarchs began leading soldiers to the eastern shores of the Mediterranean Sea. And their purpose for going was to wage war against the Muslim Abbasid Empire, and that they're particularly wanting to protect Christian interests in the re region. They want to protect pilgrims traveling, and they want to protect holy sites, particularly those sites in Jerusalem and Palestine. And these wars lasted for nearly 200 years intermittently, and they were met with varying degrees of success. But one of the lasting effects is that European nations began to realize that unique goods and products could be found if you're willing to travel to other places outside of Europe. So, one of the answers to our question, why go exploring, is that Europeans realized that there were things that they wanted and that they wanted to procure in these lands outside of Europe, and that the knowledge that even these goods exist was necessary to start this ball rolling. Well, a second factor is that will open the door to world-spanning adventure is the arrival of a uh, foreigner by the name of Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan is a Mongolian emperor who reigned between 1162 and 1227 B.A.D. And he created the most vast land empire the world has ever known. Even to this day, no one can compete with it. And as I'm sure you can remember from our previous class in Western Civ 1, Genghis Khan managed to conquer areas all the way from Korea to Poland. And for a while, it looked like his Mongolian hordes would successfully even overrun Central and Eastern Europe as well. And while the power of his rule, the Khanate, was not destined to last, from about 1227 AD to 1405 AD, most of Central Europe experienced what historians call the Pax Mongolica, or the Mongolian Peace. And in short, this means that the Silk Road was reopened between Europe and China, and many foreign goods from the Far East began slowly trickling into European markets. 
And once again, the lasting effect of this large-scale war is that distant people started taking an active interest in the stuff you could get in faraway lands. And thirdly, in 1453, the ancient Christian capital of the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople, fell to the Ottoman Turks. Now, previously, Constantinople had served as kind of a way station for Middle Eastern goods. Things coming from the east, heading west into Europe, went through Constantinople and through Christian people. Well, with the decline of the Byzantines, European traders suddenly had direct access to Islamic merchants. And this will open the door for a massive influx of Middle Eastern goods, Indian spices, and other Far Eastern things into Europe. But it also left Europeans with a rather sour taste in their mouth when it came to Islamic business dealings, as a lot of this European money is winding up in Islamic hands and is then being funneled into things like the Turkish conquest of Greece, Macedonia, Albania, Romania, etc., etc., And the result is that European merchants began to try to brainstorm new ways. How do I get a hold of all of these goods and resources without necessarily having to deal with Islamic middlemen? Now, I'd also like to stress that Islamic and Chinese goods are not the only thing that the Europeans picked up. They also began to rediscover, or in some cases discover for the first time, the ancient ideas that allowed these other cultures to remain successful, while Europe seemingly lagged behind in the doldrums of medieval feudalism. As an interesting point of note, at least to me it's interesting, one, no one in medieval Europe would have said to themselves, man, I think we're living in a dark age. No, it was only after the Renaissance, or the rebirth of ancient Greek and Roman learning, learning that was mingled with Islamic and Far Eastern advancements, did Europeans finally realize that their culture was not quite so sophisticated as they once believed. And this discovery that ancient and foreign ideas were useful and even beneficial to society compelled many with the scholarly bent that if we go exploring, we might learn even more things, and that we have more things to integrate into our culture. And then fifthly, the last of these advances I want to talk about is European technology. The art of map making or cartography became much more precise during this century. And particularly after the Spanish and the Portuguese navigators rediscovered a second century document by an astronomer named Ptolemy. This whole... uh, This whole enterprise of map making just explodes. So by 1477... This work by Ptolemy and its now famous world map had been widely circulated and it encouraged many explorers looking for an oceanic route to the Middle East, India, and China that it was possible to get there by boat. Now, another astronomical advance in this time frame is the development of what is known as the astrolabe. This is a star mapping and plotting device And once you have it calibrated, it would allow a sailor to find both the direction they're headed and to chart their apparent latitude. And this gave you much more certainty where you were located on the globe and which direction you were going. Now, additionally to all this, shipbuilding technology drastically improved with the development of things like the axial rudder, the latine, and the triangular sail. And this ended up complementing the larger square sail and rig. And all of these inventions allowed ships to sail, sometimes slowly, but they could finally sail against the way the wind was pushing. Now, the final piece of this puzzle came about with the development of a type of ship called the caravel, or the closed deck ship. You see, the biggest problem when you're traveling deep on the ocean waters is that if a large wave hits your ship, it's going to flood the whole hull with water, and the ship will sink very quickly. Well, the caravel has a closed deck, allowing for water from large waves to crash right over the deck and then run off without scuttling the ship. And so the end result of all five of these developments is that by the 1400s, Europeans knew that there were goods and products that they wanted out there in India and Asia. And additionally, Europeans started to realize they didn't like trading with Islamic merchants who were getting rich and feeding their money into Islamic and particularly Turkish empires. But now Europeans finally had a way to get around the problem. They knew that if they were brave, adventurous, and just a little bit lucky, they could set sail for the east. 
and acquire these goods directly from the source. So let us return back to our guiding question for this module. Why would Europeans risk their lives sailing on the high seas in the middle of the ocean? Well, by now I'm trying to paint a fairly obvious answer, but let me just state it explicitly. They did it all for the money. Merchants in Europe knew that there were valuable goods to be had, and they knew that there were people willing to pay top dollar for them. So, just to give you one example, a early trader who traveled along the Silk Road by the name of Marco Polo brought back this tantalizing account of the potential wealth and goods that were available if someone was just intrepid enough to adventure there. He writes this, quote, To give you an example of the vast consumption of the city of Kinsey, let us take the article of pepper, and that will enable you to have some measure of the estimate that must be the quantity of the victual, such as meat, wine, and groceries, and other things which are necessary for the general consumption of the city. Now, Mr. Marco heard stated once that the great Khan's officers of, of customs, that the quantity of pepper introduced daily into the city of Kinsey amounted to about 43 wagon loads. And each load is approximately 223 pounds, unquote. Let me summarize Marco Polo's statement there. He's saying that I went over to China and I found amazingly wealthy people who have access to goods and ideas and money that we just don't have here in Europe. And so what's going to happen is enterprising merchants will read this and other travel accounts of the Far East, India, and the Middle East. And they will conclude that there is mass money to be made. But they'll also conclude that someone's going to have to fit the bill to bring all of this stuff back to Europe and put it up for sale. And so simply put, much of the exploring in the 15th and 16th centuries is undergirded by this economic potential. So what kinds of goods and products did the Europeans covet? Well, it's hard to be dogmatic here, since some items were popular in areas, but not necessarily in others. However, several trade goods became very prominent, and they routinely fetched high prices. Let's start with the Middle East. The primary goods that people desired in the Middle East were oriental rugs, sugarcane, and spices such as cinnamon and saffron. Going a little further east to the lands that would be in modern-day India and Pakistan, we start to find spices such as peppers, mustard, coriander, turmeric, cardamom, and these were also in very high demand. Now, you go a little further east into Southeast Asia, and we start to find more exotic spices such as cloves and nutmeg. And in addition, we start to find tropical beans such as coca and coffee. Now, you finally get all the way to China, and you find a new luxury item, silk, a very soft and sheer fabric becomes very highly coveted. And from this short and in no way exhaustive li list, I think a few trends can be established. The first is that spices were big business in Europe, especially European markets, because European farmers lacked the climate and the soil that was necessary to grow these kinds of things on their own. And since European food at this time was typically lampooned as dull, bland, and boring, once the spice trade opens up, these spices will give food flavor and texture, and this will be viewed as a vast improvement. And we can still the, see the results of this today. In most American households, you see almost unlimited access to things like chili pepper, black pepper, coffee, chocolate. We see these as necessities and not luxuries. And this is a trend that started with the age of exploration. Now, a second trend that I think we can see here is that foreign textiles such as rugs and silk were in high demand because you just couldn't make them in Europe. And this will be particularly true of the silk trade, as the Chinese were able to keep the existence of silkworms secret for centuries. Now, a third trend I think we should point out is that, well, what do all these products have in common? And the simple answer is, they're rarities. They were difficult, if not impossible, to make in Europe, and the exotic nature of these luxuries made them just all the more attractive to European buyers. And we still see this mentality even today in our advertising. If you call something exotic, or you say it's imported luxury, what you're implying is that this is a product that you can only get from a certain place. 
and if you want one, it's going to cost you. Now, before we just say that it was all about the money, I, I do want to kind of hedge that bet by saying that the potential for profit isn't the only factor driving this boat here. In the late 15th and 16th century Europe, if you were a peasant, life was rather dull and boring, kind of like your food, and the potential for advancement was next to none. If you're a peasant or a serf, you worked the land of a land-owning noble. You had to pay a percentage of your productivity to the noble as your rent. And this system virtually guaranteed that peasants stayed poor because they were living hand-to-mouth and had very little potential to acquire hard money on their own. They didn't have the ability to buy land of their own. They're basically renting for life. Well, with the advent of oceanic trade routes, brave peasants learned that there may be a second option. They could sail on a ship, sometimes for years, since, you know, the average Portuguese spice run took about three years. And these spice runs were very lucrative, and when the traders returned with spices in hand, they were often paid with cash, and peasants were often allowed to take a box of these spices home with them for themselves, and they could sell them themselves. Basically, they could become independent merchants. And peasants now had the option here of taking a form of payment that would pay them hard currency. And really, the only thing it cost them was their time and their willingness to risk their lives. Now, granted, this isn't quite a great deal. I mean, it certainly, but it did certainly promise a life of adventure and excitement. And, you know, it's, many could argue it sure beats the life of a serf paying rent on a farm. So, the end result is that, as trading increased, a new class of citizen, a merchant class, begins to develop. And we might call this class a middle class. They didn't have the raw political power or access to land that the nobles did, but they started to have access to hard money. And this put them in a much higher class than serfs, and it, you, it, who, quite frankly, had no access to land or money. Now, a third aspect we should probably mention on this exploring mindset, and we cannot overlook it, is that there is a great impulse to fulfill the Great Commission. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, the writer of the Gospel says this, quote, from Jesus, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Unquote. So, we have commands to Christians to go out and make disciples. And during the Middle Ages, this evangelism had really only spread Christianity through the continent of Europe, some of North Africa, and a little bit of Western Asia. And that's just about it. But with the discovery of these pagan groups in China, India, Japan, and even in the New World... Many Christians began to realize that the task of evangelism was far from over. And because of this, many priests, monks, and missionaries are going to set sail on these ocean-bound vessels in order to reach distant lands to preach the gospel. Now, this missionary impulse had both strengths and weaknesses. On the plus side, the gospel of Christ was being preached with a new gusto that really hadn't been seen for centuries. And the message of Jesus was being translated and contextualized for new cultures and languages, and many of the missionaries, nearly all of the men, will display a very genuine concern for these people. And when they found them, they honestly tried to win souls for Christ. But the drawbacks of this missionary impulse is that the missionaries often had to travel with the sailors, soldiers, and businessmen that made these prophets and conquests possible in the first place. And so, in many ways, Christianity will be seen as a tool of this new form of mercantile imperialism. And the resulting actions and policies uh, that will develop from this could sometimes be considered human rights violations, at least by today's standards. Just to give you one example, in the early 15th and 16th century, West African slaves began to be traded by the Portuguese, the Spanish, and the Dutch. And frequently they would give this very twisted pretext for evangelism, saying, we're doing this 
and we're doing them a favor. We are making them slaves so that they can be introduced to Christianity. They wouldn't have had this opportunity had they remained in a pagan culture. And these results, in some ways, are still with us today. Many modern missionaries will tell you that if you go into an African, Far Eastern, or Native American culture, they still have a misconception that when you are asking them to convert to Christianity, you're also asking them to take on Western culture, to start speaking English or another Western language, and to make their customs virtually the same as Western Christians. And so, in a lot of ways, the drive for evangelism will be wrapped up in this kind of mercantile, imperialistic nature. And some people won't be able to tell the difference between a conquering country and Christian Christianity as a religion. So that's the basic backstory. That's why people went exploring. And many, many nations throughout Europe will jump on this bandwagon from the 1400s all the way to the 1700s. But in this lecture, we want to specifically focus on the rise of the first of these exploring nations, the Portuguese, and how they ended up controlling a good chunk of the Eastern Hemisphere. And we'll save for the next lecture how the Spanish ended up doing virtually the same thing in the Western Hemisphere. So keep all this in mind, though. Eventually, the French, the Dutch, and the British will all successfully start making colonies around the world. But that's going to be a tale for a different century and another class. For now, we're really just focused on the 1400s through the 1500s. And this is largely the story of the Spanish and the Portuguese, as they are the vanguard pl players in this endeavor to explore the world. And it's only natural that we focus on these early efforts. So let's start off with Portugal. Where is Portugal? Well, on this map here, it's that slender section marked in red that's next to Spain. You see it there on the tip of what's known as the Iberian Peninsula? That location of Portugal gave the country a distinctive advantage when it came to exploring the Atlantic Ocean, i.e. the entire coastline is on the Atlantic Ocean. They had also, in addition, they had a close proximity to the northern coast of Africa and the shortest distance of all to reach the small northern Atlantic archipelagos. These are island chains known as the Canary Islands and another island chain called the Azores. And in short, Portugal faced west towards the Atlantic, and as a people, they took full advantage of this orientation. Now, things really began to heat up for the Portuguese expansion in the early 1500s as they began establishing major colonies in what would now be t today Brazil, Angola, Mozambique. And in addition, they also conquered many major seaports along the coast of India, Indonesia, China, and even Japan. And all totaled up, notice what this map is showing, they didn't really produce a large land empire. There's not a lot of red space here. But notice that most of the areas they are covering are on the water. It's that blue area that they're controlling. And what this will mean is that the vast strength of this Portuguese initiative was that it conquered the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. They're sending their ships back and forth, back and forth, and as they controlled the shipping lanes, they controlled access to a lot of these exotic goods coming from India and the Far East. And control of these lanes made Portugal very wealthy and a very formidable empire during the 16th century. So, any respectable discussion of the Portuguese really has to begin with Prince Henry the Navigator. Henry was born the third son of King John I and Queen Philippa of Portugal. And so, Henry was not in any direct line to be king, but because he is born of noble birth, he has quite a bit of money to invest, especially in building overseas adventures. And Henry will begin to use all of these oceanic exploits to his advantage. So starting around when he's around 21, he will help his father and his older brothers conquer a port city of Setua, which is a Muslim-controlled port in what would today be Morocco in North Africa. Now, this is not a huge conquest, but what this conquest will show Henry is that all of these exotic goods that Europeans are wanting 
are coming into major ports that are controlled by the Muslims. And he realizes, if I can control this port, I can control how this stuff gets to Europe. And so there's all kinds of things that he's going to be realizing. So, for example, he knows that there's gold coming to this port somewhere south from the Sahara Desert. He knows that there's spices coming across the northern tip of Africa, somewhere from uh, Egypt, the, far, the Middle East, and so forth. And as he's gaining control of this, of this uh, city, he's gaining control of the profits from its trading. And he realizes, I don't need to conquer a whole country. I just need to control the ports where all these resources end up. And this became the mode of operations for the Portuguese Empire for about the next 165 years. They would largely conquer ports. And once you have access to the rare and valuable goods from the ports, you don't really need to control the people further than that. And to further these developments, Henry is going to begin a school for Portuguese navigators, astronomers, and cartographers. And he's basically going to encourage them, saying, find me new ways to get to cities, because if we can control their ports, we can control the stuff. And so for the rest of Henry's life, he's going to be supporting Portuguese sailing and exploring ventures. And the, again, the primary goal of this naval research is to find useful ways of getting around the northern bulge of Africa so that we can get to some of these other ports. For example, if we can get to places like Sierra Leone, the Ivory Coast, or the Gold Coast, we can start to tap into that gold export that we know is down there. And so, by the 1440s, the Portuguese will finally manage to sail around the northern bulge of Africa, and they will land in a place known as Sierra Leone. Also, we would call these today Sierra Leone, the Ivory Coast, and Ghana. And what that will do is they will bypass Islamic strongholds in North Africa and will open up direct trade with sub-Saharan African tribes, tribes and the gold production that's going on there. And this discovery will mark the beginning of European involvement in the African slave trade as one of the number one things you trade gold for is human resources. Now, unfortunately for Henry, he would not live long enough to see his ships navigate all the way around the southern tip or southern bulge of Africa. And uh, the major reason for this is a weather phenomenon, which is known as the doldrums. Simply put, once you start getting close to the equator around Africa, the wind stops playing nice. In fact, it stops playing at all, and so ships just don't have a lot of things to move them. And so what this means is that it's going to take about 50 years for someone to figure out, how do I get through this dead belt with no air, or sorry, no wind blowing through it? And the result is actually, or the answer is actually somewhat ingenious. Uh, in 1488, a Portuguese sailor is going to find out that if you sail all the way away from Africa, instead of towards it, you will eventually hit a oceanic current known as the South Atlantic Grey. And this current runs all the way down along the coast of Brazil, and then it turns sharply to the east, towards the southern tip of Africa. And so eventually Portuguese sailors will basically make this very intuitive jump that I can get to the edge of Africa by sailing away from Africa and then getting in on this current. So now the distinction of the first European to sail around the tip of Africa and thus use this current successfully is a man named Bartholomew Deus. Now, however, his ships were not outfitted for a very long sailing trek. I mean, most people don't think when you set out on a ship that I need to be equipped for an entire year or longer. So, what happened is, he got to the southern tip of Africa by sailing close to Brazil. And, you know, this is somewhat counterintuitive. And Dea simply could not account for just how many, much supplies he needed in order to find the southern coast of Africa. Now, the good news for Deus is he was still able to get home because the winds coming up the southwestern coast of Africa generally blow north and west, and so he had a relatively speedy return. Now, 
Once the Portuguese possessed this knowledge of how to get around Africa or circumnavigate the continent, it will only be a few short years before they're sending out large and well-armed armadas every year to explore the Indian Ocean and to search for direct access to the spices of India. And so, beginning in 1497, a man by the name of Vasco da Gama will lead the first Portuguese armada. It's only four ships, but again, it's still an armada, and this armada was designed to reach the western shores of India. Now, by this time, the Caraville-style ship had been upgraded to what is called the karak style ship, and this is a heavily armed cargo ship. It's capable of hauling somewhere between 100 and 120 tons of cargo, and... In addition to all that, it also sports about 20 cannons. Now, these cannons pr proved to be the decisive advantage of Portuguese trading. They couldn't conquer mainlands, but that wasn't their goal. They could certainly take over a small island and establish a fort or a factory or a naval shipyard and produce more ships, put cannons on those, and then control the seas from there. So, da Gama left Lisbon, Portugal in April 1497, and he used all of these things that we've looked at up till now. He took the Atlantic currents to get to the southern end of Africa. He then used what are called the trade winds of East Africa, and then the monsoon winds to get from East Africa to India. So, with all of these things going in his favor, he was able to reach India by May of 1498. But just keep that in mind, that it took him 13 months to get from Portugal to India. So, think about that for a second. Can you think of any job that takes you a year just to get to the first leg of it done? They're, they tend to be very tedious and not so fun jobs. But... Along the way, what da Gama is doing is he's opening trading posts. He's going to open major cities in Zanzibar and Malandi, which are today in modern-day uh, Mozambique. And he's going to do this for two reasons. The first is, da Gama is going to figure out that the kinds of things that they are bringing to trade in India are not all that useful i.e. people from India are not looking at these European goods that they're bringing to trade and saying, Ooh, I want that. And so what he's going to do is he's going to stop in East Africa in Mozambique and he's going to unload his European stockpile because the people of Mozambique are willing to trade for European goods. And in return, he's going to get things like silver, gold, pearls, ivory, and coral. And he's going to realize that all of these things are things that the Indians will trade for. And so, once he finally reaches India, da Gama and his crew will trade there for nearly five months, and then they'll start back for Portugal. He's going to finally arrive back home in Portugal in July of 1499. And this trip was so successful and so lucrative that another Portuguese sailor by the name of Pedro Cabral is going to leave the following year with a second Portuguese armada with twice as many ships. Basically saying, we now know how to get here, we know there's money to be had, let's go get it. And so, Cabral, learning everything he could from da Gama, is going to make the entire trip to India and back in 15 months. He's going to figure out the system for doing this. And so, at this point, every year, Portugal is going to send a new armada. And that's going to mean that they're going to have a pretty much a ubiquitous or, you know, constant presence in the Atlantic and Indian no Ocean as far as their ships are concerned. And this is really where the true power of the Portuguese Empire was at. With so many heavily armed ships traveling up and down the sea lanes, they're able to maintain a virtual monopoly on the spice trade, and they'll keep that monopoly until the mid-1500s. It's only when the Dutch and eventually the English navies start pushing in on their territory that the P Portuguese will no longer have naval supremacy. Now, I should probably note that not everybody is happy that the Portuguese are finding all of these really awesome sea lanes. Particularly, Muslim kingdoms in places like Persia, northern India, and Egypt, not to mention the Turkish Ottomans of Asia Minor, are going to realize that they used to have all these profits that came from the spice trade, and now Europeans are going directly to the Portuguese to buy their spices.
And so now that Christians and Europeans are getting their spices directly from the source, demand for Islamic spices are going to plummet. And so from 1503 to 1515, there's going to be nearly constant naval warfare between Islamic states and the armadas of Portugal. And heading most of these ventures is going to be a man by the name of Admiral Alphonse de Albuquerque. Now, this guy is often regarded as one of the most brilliant naval strategists of all time. And what he's going to do is he's going to rely on superior firepower and the greater mobility of Portuguese Karaks, and he's going to severely cripple Islamic maritime activity all throughout the Indian Ocean. And while I can't name everything this guy has done, here are just some of the major exploits. In 1503, he's going to meet, he's going to defeat the Zamorian fleet, and this is a fleet of uh, uh, Muslims allied with Hindus at the city of Calicut. And this will establish a permanent fort in the area. By 1507, de Albuquerque is going to sail up the Persian Gulf. And he's going to conquer the two port cities of Sohar and Ormuz. And in the process, he's going to defeat the fleet of Shah Ismail I of Persia. A little bit later, between 1509 and 1510, Da Albuquerque is going to defeat a joint fleet of Egyptians, Ottomans, and Indian ships. And once he's defeated this massive fleet, the result is he's going to capture the port city of Goa. And this will become the capital for Portuguese operations all throughout the Indian Ocean. And from this point on, Da Albuquerque is going to act as governor over all Portuguese trade until the time of his death and he's going to become quite wealthy in the process. One year later, in 1511, the Albuquerque is going to sail his fleet all the way to the islands of Indonesia, and he's going to engage another Islamic uh, man there by the name of Sultan Muhammad Shah. And the result of this is that he's going to establish a Portuguese fort in the city of Malacca, and this will virtually allow the Portuguese to corner the the market on spices such as clove and nutmeg. And then finally, in 1513, Albuquerque is going to take his fleet up the Red Sea, and he's going to engage the Egyptian Mamluks. And while this battle is largely a draw, it is going to basically assert that the Portuguese can keep the Egyptians locked away in the Red Sea. And so Portuguese control will be limited to the southern portions of the Red Sea, but will basically grant them access to the entire India, Indian Ocean unchallenged. And so by the time of that Albuquerque's death in 1515, nearly every Muslim fleet in the Indian Ocean, the Persian Gulf, and the Red Sea had been defeated by the Portuguese. And the end result is going to be that until European powers come in and challenge the Portuguese, they'll have virtual control over the Indian Ocean. So, now that you've got all those names and dates running around in your head, let's shift some gears and let's discuss how Christianity, and particularly Roman Catholic missionaries, played into this picture. So, starting with the second Portuguese armada, which was led by Pedro Cabral, missionaries began catching rides with these spice trading vessels in order that they could reach lands of India and beyond. All totaled up with Cabral, there were 19 missionaries that went along, and they first landed in Calicut, India, in 1501. Now, this first missionary venture ended rather poorly, and it's hard to say what exactly caused the disturbance, whether it was the message they were preaching, or just simply that um, they were rather abrasive. It's hard to say, but after a few days of preaching, a riot's going to break out, and three of the missionaries will be killed. Now, Cabral isn't going to stand for this, and he's going to let his military force respond for him. And so he's going to fire his cannons on the city for hours, basically to punish the city for the riot. And this will set up a very dangerous status quo that will last for centuries, where evangelism and the threat of violence and violent retaliation will be wedded together. And because of this, many people who study missions, known as missiologists, they will begin asking questions about this time period, and they'll basically be asking whether or not the witness of Christianity has been just seriously injured in these parts of the world 
because of this double standard that people coming to here to preach the gospel are preaching the gospel of peace. They're preaching the gospel of reconciliation with God on one hand, but they're also doing it under the guise of, and you know, and if you mess with us, our government's going to blow you away. And so these see the seeming double standard is going to become quite a sticky situation for people wishing to do mission work in a lot of these areas. Now, regardless of how we answer that fascinating conundrum, when we get back to, to Albuquerque, once he had conquered Goa in 1510, missionaries are going to realize there is now a major port city that we can land at and we can set up a base of operations. And so from Goa, missionary activities are going to just kind of spill out all over the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And this will increase rapidly after the 1540s when a new group of monks known as the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits will begin producing monks that are dedicated to two twin goals, educating the world and evangelizing the world. So now, if you ask my opinion, the most interesting Jesuit missionary that's going to arrive at Goa before 1600 is a man by the name of Francis Xavier. Now, he's going to be acting as what's known as a papal nuncio, i.e. He, he is acting as the official representative of the Pope. And Xavier's going to arrive at Goa in 1542, and almost immediately he's going to begin working with the native fishermen who live along the Indian coast. Now, to understand why this is important, we need to talk about Indian culture just for a second. Indian culture is based on a caste system. People of the nobility rank, of the military rank, and of the priestly rank are near the top, whereas workers, artisans are near the bottom, and people that work unclean jobs are called outcasts or pariahs, and they're near the bottom and are almost universally loathed and hated, i.e. you don't, if you're in one of these upper castes, you won't even talk to an outcast. Well, Xavier's going to go straight for working with those kind of people, and the result is that he's going to show them compassion when they're not used to finding it. And so, he's going to win hundreds of them over to the Roman Catholic faith. Now, I could probably say a ton more about Xavier, but he's one of the five people that you will have to do for one of your uh, one of you in this class will have to do a class project on him. So I wanted to save dis save discussions about him for a later time. But if there is one thing I do want to get across about Francis Xavier and other Catholic missionaries will pick up on this as well, is that as they do their mission work, they will realize that the behavior of the Portuguese sailors and merchants that they're traveling with are so appalling that it was becoming hard for them to reach people with the gospel. Simply put, the witness of these hundreds of immoral sailors and merchants was, was uh, offsetting the preaching of just a few dozen missionaries. And so, the most common response of the native Indians was simply to point to the behavior of the Portuguese sailors and say, you know, if that's what it means to be a Christian, I don't want anything to do with your religion. You know, in fact, things got so bad that by the time Xavier was about ready to leave Goa, he basically has to write a letter to the king of Portugal saying, this has to stop. One of my favorite scholars, a man named Samuel Moffat, writes it this way. He says this, quote, When he returned the next year, Xavier was soon, had soon come to the conclusion that the Portuguese Christians in the trading post were as great an, uh, an obstacle to the spread of the gospel in India as any of the Indian superstitions or Hindu resistance to Christian evangelism. He was so shocked by the open immorality of the European traders and the cruelty and corruption of the Portuguese officials, that at one point he wrote to the king in Lisbon saying this, quote, Unless you threaten your officials with prison and the confiscation of their goods, and actually carry out your threats, all of your commands to us as missionaries for the furtherance of Christianity in Europe will be in vain. Unquote. And so this will bring us to our major discussion question for, the mod for this module, and that is, what are these primary motivations that drove people like Columbus and Vasco da Gama and others to search for shorter trade routes to India and the Far East? 
And then compare that with reasons for Christian missions. In regard to Christian missions, do you feel that these motivations helped or hindered the spread of Christianity? Or if you prefer a simpler way to put this, was the business of spice trading compatible with the mandate to preach the gospel? So, be ready to discuss this. It could show up on a test. Now, so far we've been talking about Christian missionary activity, and I may have made it seem like the land of Idi India is entirely populated with either Islamic peoples or Hindu believers. Well, this is actually not entirely true, and while those two religious groups did constitute the majority of people you'd find in India, there were you should also know that there was about 100,000 Christians already living in India when Vasco da Gama arrived. And this group had largely been separated from Western Christianity ever since what's known as the Nestorian Schism back in 431 AD. And this happened when the followers of Nestorius, who is a theologian and patriarch of Constantinople, was exiled outside the Roman Empire. Eventually, they set up shop in places like Syria, places like Babylon, which eventually became Baghdad. And from there, they started exerting influence on Christians that had already moved all the way out into India. Now, according to the legends, these Indian Christians believe that the first century disciple, Thomas, that's right, the disciple of Jesus, the one who said, unless I put my hands into the hole in his side and put my hand into the hole that was put in his hand, I won't believe that Jesus is risen, you know, the same doubting Thomas. Well, according to their legend, this Thomas came to India later in his life, and he set up seven churches in India before he was martyred. Now, because of this legend, the Christians of India started to call themselves the St. Thomas or the Martama Christians. And they are a minority group for certain. They are certainly surrounded by greater numbers of Islamic and Hindu believers. But these St. Thomas Christians are, to be honest, initially happy when the Portuguese show up. Because, oh look, here's finally another Christian group. Finally we have people we can relate to. And they'll actually be so happy about the Portuguese showing up that the Archbishop of the Mar Thomas during the time of Vasco da Gama, a man by the name of Mar Jacob, is going to help da Gama establish his trading privileges in the major ports of Calicut and Kochi. Now, I will say, this warm welcome went south and cold very, very quickly. The Roman Catholics realized that the isolation of the St. Thomas Christians had produced a very culturally distinct form of Christianity, and quite frankly, culturally distinct in Roman Catholic eyes usually meant it's heresy. It will send you to hell. And this is a theological situation that is very similar to the 7th century dispute we would have seen in Western Civ I between the Roman Catholics and Celtic Christianity. The, and the problem is simply this. If you separate a Christian group from other Christian groups for too long, eventually they will develop their own traditions they will develop their own theology. And if they ever meet up with other Christian groups centuries later, both groups will often have a hard time recognizing each other as Christians at all. And this is exactly what has happened here. In particular, the Catholics are going to denounce three practices of the St. Thomas Christians. They're going to call them anathema, meaning if you continue to believe this, you will go to hell. And the first of these problems that the Catholics saw is that the Martama Christians are in submission to the Nestorian Patriarch of Baghdad. Now, it's hard to tell whether or not the Martama believers are actually Nestorians themselves. We don't have much of their own writings. But for the Roman Catholics, this association with a known heretical group is not acceptable. Now, the second problem the Catholics are going to have is that the St. Thomas Christians do not erect icons or use bas-reliefs in their church. And the Roman Catholics are going to take this as a sign of iconoclasm, i.e. that they destroyed icons and that they have been somehow influenced by Islamic thought improperly. Now, the third problem the Catholics are going to have is that the liturgy of the St. Thomas Christians is conducted in a language known as Syriac, and all of their copies of Scripture are also in Syriac. It's a translation known as the Peshetta. And 
Catholics will take a look at this translation, they'll realize, oh, you guys are missing books in your New Testament. You don't have the Revelation of John, you don't have James, you don't have Hebrews, you don't have Jude, you don't have 1st through 3rd John. And so, all totaled up, the Roman Catholics are going to condemn the religion of the St. Thomas Christians, and that they are going to begin preaching that unless they start submitting to the Pope in Rome and all of his official teachings from the Roman Catholic Church, that these Thomas Christians will be, i.e., no longer Christian and will be going to hell as heretics. So, unfortunately, for about the next 100 years, Roman Catholic priests and missionaries will begin doing everything in their power to undermine St. Thomas Christianity. They will do things to have uh, Thomas uh, priests and bishops removed from office. They will try to have them imprisoned or exiled. And once that happens, the Catholics will swoop in and try to replace them with European clergy that are loyal to the Pope. Now, these developments will not be taken well. And by 1599, in a synod known as the Synod of Demphir, there will be an official split made between the Thomas Christians and the Catholics. The Roman Catholics are going to condemn the St. Thomas uh, Christians, and they'll use terms very similar to what we would have seen in the Synod of Whitby back in 668 AD. One of the canons of that synod reads like this, and I say this, quote, There cannot be two laws for the Church of India, one law of St. Thomas and another law of St. Peter. There can be only one law, the law of Christ. Moreover, Christ has only one vicar who declares as declares this synod, that this vicar is the head of the whole church on earth. And all those who deny obedience to this said Roman bishop are transgressors of divine commands and cannot obtain eternal life. Unquote. Or if I could put this in my somewhat snarky Protestant way, yeah, there's only one law, the law of Christ, but really the law of Peter is the only one that counts because only the Pope in Rome can tell you what the law of Christ actually means. Well, at this point, the St. Thomas Christians basically said, uh, no thanks, we'll go elsewhere. And they walked out of the Senate. And from this point on, the two groups have basically been telling each other, you're wrong, you're going to hell ever since. So, I guess while we're on the subject of Christian separation, let's shift gears just a little bit and talk about the Portuguese problems with the Spanish. You see, in 1492, when Christopher Columbus made his epic journey all the way into the New World, when he came back, he didn't go back immediately to Spain. He made a short stop in Lisbon, Portugal, and he managed to tell King John II of Portugal everything that he had found sailing west. Now, he, of course, Columbus is going to tell John that he found a route to India. Well, he didn't find India. He found the Caribbean Islands instead. But regardless, John II is going to become upset by this because Spain had funded Columbus's mission. And basically, Spain and Portugal already had an existing pact, as it were, basically saying that all islands in the Atlantic Ocean, south of the Canary Islands, were to be the property of Portugal. Well... Columbus's discovery is certainly an island south of the Canary Islands. They're very, very far west of the Canary Islands, too, but they are south of the Canary Islands. And so, for the next two years, this argument is going to go back and forth between Spain and Portugal, until finally, Pope Alexander VI is going to be asked to enter into this dispute and settle it once and for all. And the result is that, in 1494, there's going to be the uh, Treaty of Tordesillas, which will attempt to divide the exploration and conquest of the world between the Spanish and the Portuguese. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, what about the French? What about the Germans? What about the British? Don't they get a say? Well, apparently they weren't all that important to Alexander VI, and they certainly weren't all that important to the Portuguese or the Spanish. But let us just say for the time being that this division was between these two world naval powers, and the division went something like this. There we go. You see that map? You see that line running all the way down through Greenland and through part of South America? That somewhat arbitrary line of demarcation is the 46th degree west of the prime meridian 
i.e. it's a line of longitude. And the Treaty of Tordesillas is basically going to say this. The Spanish have permission to settle the New World and anything to the west of 46 degrees west. While the Portuguese can claim everything from 46 degrees west and east of that, which will include the eastern half of Brazil and all of the Indian Ocean and all of Africa. And the major result of this is that the Portuguese will found a colony in Brazil. And by the 17 and 1800s, Brazil will actually become their most successful colony because it will be their most settled colony. And so starting early off around 1550, Brazilian plantations will begin producing a major product known as sugar cane. And there's also a side product you make from sugar cane, and that is rum, which is basically a distilled spirit you make from sugar. And this is going to be a very large-scale agricultural venture, and it's going to require a significant amount of human labor in order to get the job done. And of course, the Portuguese are going to supply this labor by trading in slaves from their other trading posts that they had established on Sierra Leone, Angola, and Mozambique. And so, by the end of the 1500s, nearly 1,000 to 2,000 slaves are being transported every year to supply the steady demand for human labor on Brazilian sugar plantations. And we'll talk about this problem of the transatlantic slave trade in later lectures, but just for now I want to suffice to say that this state of affairs started some potentially sticky situations for future generations like ours to have to sort out. All right, and so before we go on to the Spanish, let's go ahead and pause here and draw some conclusions about Portuguese exploration. The first major point I want you to take home is that the Portuguese set a standard for European imperialism during the early age of exploration. And in many ways, this will be a might makes right type of pragmatism. Because the Portuguese had the power to control the Indian Ocean by naval power, they did. Because the Portuguese had the power to violently protect their businesses and their missionary endeavors, they did. Because the Portuguese had the power to export human beings from Africa and force them into slave labor, they did. And other Europeans are going to be looking kind of over the shoulders here, and they'll be taking some very careful notes. And what's going to happen is European nations are going to follow suit, and most of them are going to act this way in the affairs of South America, Asia, Africa, and even in the New World. All of these European nations are going to follow Portugal's lead, and this state of affairs will continue pretty much until World War I. Now, the second take-home point I want you to get is that all these European powers are not only going to adopt the status quo, they will rarely question the status quo. And they will use numerous ways of justifying this. They will justify it politically, you know. We have to control the area. We have to make sure that these upstart nations don't undermine the status quo. They'll do it theologically. Look, these people aren't Christians. It's our right to go in and conquer them. They'll do it financially. Look, we are making tons of money and we have to control this, you know, for the good of the state. And they'll do it pragmatically. We just want to do it. And you know what? We're going to do it well. And so the end of all of these justifications, the end result of all of this is going to be that European nations will become exceedingly wealthy because of this mercantile imperialism. And it's going to take about 250 to 400 years before they start developing a conscience about it. And by this time, the damage done is very deep, it crosses many cultures, and in some cases it may even seem irreversible. And so today, we still very much feel these consequences when we speak about how Europeans and people of European descent relate to people of African descent, Asian descent, Indian descent, Native American descent. And all of these problems will largely have taken root and come to full blossom during this time period. And we're going to be unpacking these consequences for a large chunk of this class, in fact. And so, I know that's a lot to think about, my friends. 
For now, I would like to ask that God would bless you in your studies, and we'll see you again later on this week when we discuss the Spanish conquest of Central and South America.